Gender Transformation Hearings on Technical and Vocational Education and Training, that's your TVET colleges. As a constitutional institution responsible for promoting respect for gender equality, the Commission is concerned with uh, the lack of uh, proper understanding of uh, gender dynamics that are accompanied by a slow pace of transformation within the, these TVET colleges. Now, the hearings uh, ended today. We talk about what transpired there with Dr. Ntabise Moleko. Dr. Moleko is the acting chairperson of the Commission for Gender Equality. Good afternoon to you. Thank you so much for coming through. Thanks for having me. Now, we understand some colleges, TVET colleges that were summoned to appear before the hearing didn't make it yesterday. So what happens going forward? So the process is we give a issue a notice um, to them to appear according to our act, uh, section 18 of the act. And there's no, if you don't provide real justification for you to not appear, we can actually go to the courts and go to the extreme lengths of actually uh, issuing summons against you and having, as a result of that offense, a six-month fine or even imprisonment. So what we will do, three of the four did uh, appear before the commission. One did not appear, and that was Coastal College. And uh, we are going to further estimate our costs for the wastage, mm -hmm. and we will appropriate accordingly the wastage of costs because resources are spent on these hearings. You fly up individuals who are in the legal team. Some of the commissioners are not from here, and uh, it's a waste of time. So yeah. we just want to send a message to say, if we uh, agree on a date and there's a hearing, you should appear before the uh, Chapter 9 is the constitutional body. But what body. impression is this creating on Chapter 9 institutions, specifically the uh, Commission for Gender Equality? Is it worrying? Is it a worrying pattern? Absolutely. It's not a pattern, I would not say, but I think for an institution and an accounting office at this level to not take seriously notice to appear, it's either an incompetence issue, not understanding what it means, but you also find that some sectors don't even understand what gender equality is and what the commission is. So I think that education needs to take place. So I think going forward, uh, we need to educate, I think, some of our institutions about some of the existing Chapter 9 institutions. And it talks to also um, highlighting the need for us to be actually more effective and being known and doing more to get our message across. So mm -hmm. I think it's internal, but also external. But I think it also speaks to issue of incompetence as to an accounting officer not taking seriously a notice um, to appear before an institution like ours uh, is very concerning. It speaks to competence in the sector itself. All right. So what really prompted these hearings um what really prompted the commission to look into TVET colleges per, per se, not any other institutions of higher learning? So we have. We've done universities previously. Um, now we looked at TVET colleges because we haven't looked at them previously. And we believe that they're a key instrument to transforming the economy um, and also the education sector. So we believe that TVET colleges have massive imp in implication and they directly influence marginalized communities, rural communities, communities on the peripheries, and particularly with some of the changes that are proposed in the education system. To vet colleges require a specific focus um, and to look at are they equipped, do they have the necessary capacity to actually deal with what the country is uh, targeting going forward. And so we wanted to look at specifically the Tibet space. We've never done it as mm -hmm. a commission either, and we thought this would be a good place to start. And I think it was a good thing that we did. All right. So in terms of um, choosing the Tibet colleges to appear before the commission, how did you go about doing that? Because I think we have more than 50 Tibet colleges in South Africa. Correct. Why the, the these four only for now? So it's this issue of sampling. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at coastal colleges, a mix between urban and rural, but also what we did was work with the department. And I think what they did was to select for us the ones who actually have the most problems. So we got the problem children. And I think if you start with those, put measures and mechanisms in place, policies and procedures in place in those, you can then begin to start solving the problem at a macro level. So you always have to start at least at a micro level with sampling. So we sampled according to those, um, to those uh, dynamics, but we were led also by the department and mm -hmm. so they helped us to identify yeah. some of these colleges and they really are um, some of the least performing um, and the low performing uh, colleges in the lot. And what's the status quo at the Stevet colleges in terms of this um, gender transformation? Uh, let's just talk a bit about vulnerabilities and perhaps some risks that are experienced by women in Tibet colleges. So we look at uh, there's a three-prong approach there's management that you look at there's students and there's actually staff that that's academia within the Tibet space. So we look at all three levels. We look at, for, for instance, I think 
The most important is the students. Are they safe on campus? Is there any sexual harassment policy in place? Should there be uh, transgressions in that regard? We found that in most of the colleges, there was no sexual harassment policy. We found that most of some of the important policies addressing safety and security are on draft format. So it talks to the issue of there are ineffective mechanisms at the college level to respond to such problems. You then have to look at academia. Is there adequate representativity of your middle management and also some of your lecturer staff, particularly in what we call STEM-related sectors? So not all the Tibet colleges are in the sciences, technology, engineering, and math sectors, but some of the non-normal uh, non sectors where women are underrepresented, you want to change the interface between the scholars and the learners. You want to have underrepresentation changed um, towards some of these subsectors, and you have to use career guidance and other tools uh, that make some of these subsectors interesting for people that don't ordinarily have information. And then the last leg is the executive management and the principals. Mm. These are appointed by the custodian, which is a department. We then looked at representativity in terms of transformation and whether there was gender parity um, at a wage level, but also at a representativity level, at a senior management level. We found there to be, in most instances, of these usually four DPs, what they call deputy principals. Uh, these were weighted towards usually the male um, counterpart. 75 to 80% were usually male, and predominantly it would be one lady in the deputy principal role or as a principal. So you're finding that the weighting is towards underrepresentativity. So the question is what measures and mechanisms can you put in place to change this? Yeah. So we said that let's put targets in place in the employment equity plans. Let's monitor these over th the two to three year trajectory. Let's work with the department which sets performance targets for the principals themselves, which we don't do, so that they have this as a KPI. If you don't change the behavior and incentivize good behavior, you are unlikely to see any amendments. Mm. It, it's very interesting, Dr. Maluko, because I once had a guest here on the show talking about transformation at institutions of higher learning, and I think she painted the very same picture, but hers, I think it was from the um, Universities of Technology's perspective. Mm. So she very concerned she was on the slow pace of gender transformation at these institutions of higher learning. So you say that you've sampled other universities, hence you're looking at Tivet colleges now. W what, what did you find? So the other universities, I mean, we looked at, when you talk universities in South Africa, these are also more independent than Tibet colleges. Um, they have councils, they have uh, their own appointing procedures. But I think you're finding the systemic issue is that there is under-representativity across the board. If you look at universities now, um, if I was to, I don't want to name and shame universities, but you do know that specific universities, you might find there's one black female professor mm -hmm. in the whole contingency of professors in an institution in South Africa in 2019, it's absurd. Um, this cannot be. And the question is, why can this be allowed to continue? And I think it's because you have different, uh, I'd say, there's means that universities have to allow professorships, and they differ across the board. Can you standardize those who will measure those mechanisms and make sure that universities transform accordingly? We understand the issue um, that it's an external, there's external forces around publication, around uh, quality of uh, journals that are submitted to, and so, so on and so forth. But the question is, the pace at which this transformation is mm. happening is not rapid enough. Yeah. And I think that the emphasis is where there is fiscal pressure that you can apply on participants and universities the custodian, which is the department, should because 70% of the budget is going towards uh, universities. 16.7% 16, of the budget goes to these Tibet colleges. Mm. So it's heavily weighted. If you withhold budget because of non-performance, I'm telling you now there will a change in it. behavior. But yeah. if you don't put means and measures in place to track this performance, why should they change if they've always done this and nothing happens? Very interesting. Mm. Time constraints. We have to leave this discussion at this, but thank you so much for coming through. Dr. Ntabise Moliko is uh, the acting chairperson over the Commission for Gender Equality. As I said earlier, some 40 vet colleges had appeared before uh, the Commission's hearings today to look at uh, gender progress and transformations within those institutions of higher learning. Time now for some spot update. Uh, Peter is standing by.